Okay, uh, I think we can start. So, um, welcome again, uh, everybody. And uh, thanks to Air India, you are hearing me now. Uh, the originally scheduled speaker is on her way and she will be speaking later in the week. Um, so, we were uh, discussing you know, the coverage of topics and sometime last week, uh, somebody pointed out that nobody is actually talking about unsupervised ML. So, I thought I'll do that. Um, so Saurabh just gave you an introduction to basic probability theory and uh, inference and you know basic hypothesis testing and so on. So we actually haven't had an intro to ML as such yet. So briefly, machine learning just means learning from data. And it's commonly uh, divided into um, two categories. Um, supervised means that you have a kind of training data set where you know what the answer you're looking for is an example of a typical data set might be like this. This is uh, from uh, the UCI uh, University of California Irvine ML repository. It's a data set base of diabetes in uh, Lima Indians. And this is what it typically looks like. It's tabular data where the last column might be, it's called the outcome column. It might be just ones and zeros here, meaning either they have or they don't have diabetes. In a typical um, supervised machine learning task, you want to learn um, from this data set what uh, about these other features, pregnancies, glucose, blah, blah, could predict the outcome variable. And uh, then if you are given a new data set, you might want to be able to predict in those cases. So, um, few introductory aspects here. If you look at these data, you'll see some different kinds of numbers. So these BMI and diabetes uh, all have decimal points in them. So they are real numbers, um, floating point numbers, if you like. Uh, so um, whereas the last column is uh, a binary column, it has just zeros or ones. So you have uh, these different kinds of data. You have uh, um, binary data, two values, which is what the binary trials that sort of talked about is you just have two values. You have uh, categorical data where you have more than two values, but they're still discrete categories. For example, religion might be a category. Um, you have uh, ordinal data where you have categories, but you also have some kind of ordering among those categories. So over here, the number of pregnancies might be an example of ordinal data. Um, it's not going to be a floating point number like one and a half. It will be something between zero and in this case, up to 11. But uh, there is a concept of two is greater than one, three is greater than two and all that. In this particular case, you have things that don't have a decimal point, but they probably should be treated as real numbers. They are continuous. They will, they've just been truncated at some point. So um, that's the kind of data that you commonly end up working with then. Um, machine learning and uh, biomedical applications. So this is the input data set and you have an outcome variable. Um, in supervised learning, you uh, and in unsupervised learning, uh, which will come to, you are looking for a model that takes these input variables in this case uh, in, in supervised learning and predicts an output variable. But um, you've all probably done things like fitting regression curves and so on. And, well, you can take a bunch of points. Supposing you have a bunch of points on a blackboard, uh, sorry, on, a, on an axis, you have points like this, and you ask what is the curve that fits these points? And um, you can fit it with a straight line. It might look like uh, this. You might fit it with a quadratic, and then it might look like this. And if you use a polynomial with five parameters, you can actually fit all five points. Now the trade-off here is, uh, supposing somebody gives you a sixth point, how good are you at predicting where that point will lie? And the more you fit on the data you have, the more you might be overfitting and uh, therefore doing badly on data that you haven't seen. So I'll just briefly talk about it in the supervised case. Uh, what you typically do is you don't uh, fit on your entire training set. You um, divide your data set into a training plus validation set and a testing set. And 
you ensure that whatever model you're training, um, it is tuned as much as possible. So in the training set itself, you have a separate training set and a validation set. So you um, fine tune the parameters of your model. You might want to explore linear, quadratic, whatever within that space. You validate it, uh, you train it on the training part of the training set, you validate it on the validation. Once you're happy with everything that you have, then you test it on the testing set. And the testing set has not seen your training data at all. And that's the uh, cleanest way to do it. So with that, um, uh, I'll touch upon model choosing and overfitting a bit later if there's time. But anyway, so now we're talking about um, unsupervised learning and in particular clustering. So what is clustering? Uh, it's basically looking at these, uh, so these data sets can have lots of entries, which is the size, the number of rows. And each entry can have many attributes, which is a dimension. So ignoring the last column for a moment, you have eight dimensional data here. Um, so the point of clustering is, is there some structure to these rows? Uh, do you have uh, some groups of these rows are more similar to each other than other groups of these rows? And uh, is if there is a structure, what uses it? Maybe you can get a new data set and you, you, if you find the structure, you might find that some of these uh, came from maybe a rural background or some of these are pre-existing conditions or you might learn things about these um, uh, cluster sub-items. So visually speaking, this is an example of what you might have. Uh, um, this is a two-dimensional data set. Uh, it's very hard to visualize eight dimensions. Um, in two dimensions, supposing somebody gave you this. Now, just eyeballing this, you might decide that, you know, there are three clusters, one. Maybe you decide there are two clusters, or maybe you can decide there are three, or maybe you can decide there are more. If you actually put it through a clustering program, in this case, hierarchical clustering, uh, this is actually what it gives you. So the different colors are the different clusters. And you can see that there are three big clusters, but it's put a bunch of points in other clusters. So what I'm going to talk about in this uh, presentation, and um, as before, uh, stop me at any point, and um, sorry if it's not very well prepared, but uh, how do you, given these uh, data sets, how do you cluster them? Uh, there are many different ways. How do you um, maybe choose the number of clusters? How do you know there are three clusters, four clusters, five clusters? What's appropriate here? Two clusters. And uh, one more point that I'd like to make, I might come back to it in a later talk, that you know, we showed an eight-dimensional data set, and here I'm visualizing a two-dimensional data set. Um, what if you really have an eight or a 20 or a 100-dimensional data set? So if you think about how um, uh, the structure of, you know, dimensionality of space affects distances, that's, uh, we'll talk about distance metric shortly, uh, but visually, you know, you're saying these points are closer together, these points are further away, you need some way to measure distances. If you think about, if the higher dimensional your space is, the further apart things get in some sense. So if you talk about uh, the area of a circle, it goes like R squared. Or a sphere, it goes like R cubed. And N dimensional sphere, you go like R to the power N. And what this does is it just explodes extremely rapidly as R grows. So supposing you take an N dimensional sphere, and ask what fraction of that volume r to the power n is near the uh, skin of the sphere. Here, uh, for r squared, it's uh, like, you know, if your skin is like 10%, it's like 100th. Here, I mean, here you'll find that almost all the volume of your sphere is right next to the skin. So in some sense, uh, the further you go about, the more rapidly you get spread apart. So this kind of visualization is very, misleading, though it happens all the time. You don't really know how it'll look in high-dimensional data sets. One thing that people do is uh, reduce the dimensionality of the data set for various reasons. I'll uh, come to that maybe in a later talk. So right now, let's deal with this. You have points in some abstract vector space, as uh, physicists, mathematicians call it. It's not just two coordinates, but you might have 20 coordinates. And in the previous data set, you had a mixture of ordinal, categorical, normal variables. Let's say everything is a real number. So let's say in your data set, you have um, a bunch of real numbers. So the first task is how do you tell how far apart two points are? So these are some common um, distance metrics that people use. Um, so let's take first the two-dimensional case. Supposing you have the two points, 
one one and two three on a plane. So one one is let's say here and two three is here. So you're asking what is this distance? And the answer, uh, as you'll remember, is three minus one the whole square. No. Yes, let's do it the other way. That's how you calculate it from Pythagoras theorem. And this generalizes to multiple dimensions, and this is called the Euclidean distance. Um, if you have a two points. And the Euclidean distance is sum of x i minus y i squared, where the sum over i goes over all dimensions, and the square root of the whole thing. So this is the most common distance metric used, but there are other distance metrics that one sometimes uses. Uh, there's something called the Manhattan distance, which is basically, um, if you think of it as a grid, how many um, so you, you could think of an, uh, a sum of absolute values of these points, right? So, um, so it's not exactly the Manhattan distance. I think I got that wrong. Uh, Manhattan distance would be on a grid where um, you want to walk along the grid. You, have, you want to take the distance between two points, but you can't walk in a straight line. So the distance would be the sum of these x difference and the yeah, it's actually that's what it is. Um, this is just a uh, sum of um, x i minus y i absolute value. There's something called the Chebyshev distance, which is the maximum of uh, any of these. Uh, if in this case uh, it's actually square, but let's say you take a grid where you have um, these two points. Now, um, the x difference is two, the y difference is three. In the Chebyshev distance, you take uh, the smaller or the bigger, it's a, the bigger one. You take the bigger one as a distance. And it's also called the king's move distance because if you were on a chessboard, this is, uh, if these were the centers of the chess squares, a king can move, you know, uh, left or up or diagonally. And this is the number of moves that the king would need to take to reach this point. So it would go like diagonal, diagonal up, or in many other ways. So that distance is three. And all these are special cases of something that's called the LP distance, which is a summation over i of x sub i minus y sub i to the power p, where p is some number, the whole to the power one by p, the pth root. Um, so if you put p is equal to two, you get the Euclidean distance. If you put p is equal to one, you get the um, Manhattan distance. And if you put P is infinity, you get the Chebyshev distance essentially. You have to take P very large. And the cosine distance is kind of a generalized angle between two points. Uh, so it's basically X i dot Y i, if you remember dot products, um, divided by, if you don't understand this, uh, let it be. Um, but if those of you who've done maths in, you know, First year college probably understand this. Um, all these things are used in the literature, but why do we need a distance metric? Basically because in a clustering like this, we want to know which things to bring together. So that's the distance metric. Uh, according to some distance metric that you have um, decided to use, your uh, um, algorithm has optimized some measure and told you that this is how you cluster it. So what would you do? Um, this is perhaps the conceptually simplest form of clustering. It's widely used in phylogenetics, but also in uh, other circumstances. And it's maybe the most intuitive uh, example of all. So the idea is that you have a bunch of points. I'm again going to draw a bunch of points in some abstract space and imagine that one of these is, okay. So first of all, what are these data? They're, these days, typically they are, uh, genomic data are taken from certain regions of the genome that don't, uh, um, that are highly conserved across all these species. And then um, you have a distance metric, which is basically how similar they are. And then you do a standard clustering algorithm. I will quickly overview you know, what it is, but uh, essentially what you do is at every step you have a, so initially you have a bunch of points. You think of each point as its own cluster. So if you had N points, you have N clusters initially. And over here, what you do is you find, identify the closest two points 
let's say these two, and you merge them together. And then um, as you uh, merge them, you kind, you kind of fuse them. So now instead of n clusters, you have n minus one clusters. And now you want to calculate pairwise distances between the current clusters, and you define the distance between two clusters. Uh, as just an average of all pairwise distances, um, every point in C1, of the X and Y. Just add up all these pairwise distances divided by the sizes of C1 and C2. So it's UPGMA stands for unweighted pairwise group method of average, something like that. So um, supposing I've now fused these two and their new cluster, but now I want to calculate the distance between this cluster and this cluster. The distance between these two is the average of this distance, this distance, this distance, and this distance. Four numbers averaged by, uh, divided by four, because that's two times two. So that's all it is, a very simple method. And uh, you do it uh, iteratively starting from everything in its own cluster until you brought everything together in one cluster. That's where you reach this point. And that's the output of uh, agglomerative program. Now, just looking at this, you can kind of see some cluster structure, which may be, I mean, they've helpfully color coded it for you. So if you want to believe there are just three structures, uh, three clusters, maybe you will draw a line along here. What you do is basically you draw these vertical lines and that breaks up the clusters. Now these are no longer connected to these, which are no longer connected to these. So you have one cluster of cartilaginous fish, one cluster of bony skin fish, one cluster of everything else. And instead you might want to draw a line somewhere else. Let's say you want to draw it here. Then you have uh, one cluster here, one cluster here. Coelacanth is a cluster of its own. Lungfish is a cluster of its own. Then you have a cluster of uh, frogs. Then you have uh, lizard, birds, mammals, all grouped together. Or you could draw a line here and that will separate out your birds and your mammals. So. As I said, you know, one question is how many clusters do you really want? And uh, there is no sort of correct answer to that. It depends on the situation. But in terms of modeling, how many clusters do you want, which will come to depends on you know, how many, uh, how, it's related to the overfitting question. So this is maybe the simplest way to um, cluster a set of points, just draw this dendrogram kind of thing, and then visually look at it, see where you want to draw the line. and um, in, I guess that's why it's so widely used in uh, certain fields. There are other approaches that where you decide how many clusters you want. Um, the most common is called k-means. It's uh, centroid based. So what is a centroid in, you know, what is the centroid of a triangle, right? Uh, in high school geometry, it's just the place where the three medians of the triangle meet. So median divides the opposite side into two. Uh, equal pieces and the three medians meet at a point it's called the centroid and the centroid is actually the center of gravity of the triangle more generally um, you have a cluster of points uh, which is not three it could be 300 or whatever so you have all these points and you have coordinates for all of them and the centroid of that cluster is just the uh, arithmetic mean of all these uh, coordinates so now if you have uh, let's say um, data set like this, and you want to, so for this method, you have to figure out first what K is. I will come to how to figure that out later, but supposing you choose K is equal to two, that's uh, maybe some prior intuition, you have that K is equal to two. So now you need two points which will serve as your centroid. And maybe in your ideal situation, these are the two points. Um, let me make it here. And what this is saying is that these points are, each point is assigned to the centroid that is closest to it. But what you want to minimize, I mean, you can always pick two points and then you can assign points to centroid closest to it. There are many ways to do that. You want to minimize something and that is the sum of squared distances within a cluster. That means uh, 
I mean, well, why do we minimize that and not just the sum of distances? Because this is mathematically easier to do that about it. Um, so uh, you want to choose this red point such that um, this distance plus uh, squared plus this distance squared and so on, as well as this distance squared plus this distance squared and so on is as low as you can get. That uh, under algorithms to um, calculate this distance efficiently, how do you minimize it? There is no algorithm guarantee to do it. It's what computer scientists call them NP hard problem, but there are heuristic algorithms that can do it extremely fast and give you um, almost all the time a very good answer, um, perhaps the best answer. So um, that's basically, uh, and the way it is done is sort of iterated. First you pick uh, these centroids fairly randomly, and then you assign these uh, points to the clusters. But now that you've got a new cluster, you can pick the new centroid because um, you've got a cluster of points here. The true centroid of this cluster of points is no longer this red dot, it's moved somewhere else. So you move that to the new point. And similarly, this one, then you reassign points to new cluster, keep doing that. This is guaranteed to converge to a local minimum, but not necessarily to the globally best answer. So you might need to do it a few times, but um, there are very efficient algorithms to do it um, as part of scikit-learn and so on. So that's k-means. It works also with discrete data if you do some things like one-hot encoding, which I won't get into. Um, for continuous data, there's a more sophisticated thing. So I, I won't maybe go into it too much just for those who understand what this is. Uh, so I've introduced a univariate Gaussian distribution, which is basically, it looks exactly like this, except uh, sigma is just a number and mu is just a number. So um, here we have a multivariate distribution where X is a vector of observations. It's like an observations. Mu is also a vector of means. And this is what's called the covariance matrix. Um, so I won't get into what that means, but this is a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And the assumption is that you have a bunch of points. So if you go back to the tabular data we showed, you might have a bunch of rows and you could imagine that the entire thing came, is drawn from some uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution, just one Gaussian distribution. But you could also imagine that these came from one distribution and these came from another. So there are two distributions here. Or you could imagine that there were three distributions. So um, for every choice of K, you have a new hypothesis and you can ask what is the choice of clusters that maximizes the likelihood of your data? Because given a distribution, you have a probability for each data point there. So you can get the likelihood of the data. And again, it is done by an iterative algorithm called EM, um, expectation maximization. Um, so again, I'll skip past that today, but uh, it is a very um, powerful, and again, it's not guaranteed to find the global optimum, but it's a, uh, it always finds a good answer, which may not be globally the best, so you do it a few times. So the basic idea, again, is that you sort of assign each point to a cluster, then you calculate the parameters mu and sigma, and then you use those mu and sigma to um, reassign. So it's very similar to k-means in that way. Um, this is quite widely used. And if you look at packages like scikit-learn, there are a whole bunch of other algorithms. So um, here is an image from scikit-learn. And the idea, so these are various data sets. The rows are different kinds of data sets where clustering might be challenging. And uh, in some cases, you may not. So let's say, take the last one first. How will you even cluster this? Uh, it just looks like a blob. They've pre-clustered it. For, imagine that you had everything in black and white. Ignore the colors for now. So in this case, you have three clear clusters and all the programs nail that. Um, in this case, you might, as a human being looking at it, you might say you have two clusters because you have an inner circle and an outer circle. But if, you, uh, if your algorithm tries to cluster them, it might be more likely to pull, draw a line through it or something. It turns out that uh, um, agglomerative clustering uh, does very well because it actually will pick all these points and connect them into one cluster, pick all these points and connect them into one cluster. So even though there are points here which are very distant because, uh, because of the tree structure, they will come together. Whereas this is a case where k-means doesn't work. It just draws a line here. And that's just an arbitrary answer because it could equally have drawn a line here. 
Um, or take an example like this, that uh, you have two clusters, but they are kind of overlapping in this strange way. As a human, you can see that they are separate. And in uh, here, even agglomerative clustering, it seems does not do a great job, but there are other programs that do. Um, in these cases, it's not even obvious what the correct answer is, how many clusters they should be and so on. Here you have visually clearly separated clusters, but they sort of overlap in both X dimension and Y dimension. And that causes problems for some programs. So here, agnominative puts these two in one cluster, though you would think they are two. So here again, I want to emphasize that in some sense, these are toy examples because they're all two dimensional. You never have two dimensional data. And uh, this kind of weird structure might not arise in higher dimensions, or if it does, um, you might end up. So for example, if you do a technique called TCA here to reduce the dimensionality, you might actually end up with one dimensional data that has a clear clustering. And what you are basically doing is changing from the X axis and Y axis, you're kind of rotating it to an axis that goes like that, sorry. An axis that goes in this direction. If this is your X axis, then you, and then this is your Y axis, then you will see a much clearer clustering. Similarly here, you have a coordinate transformation from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. Um, then any program will give you the cluster because X and Y are all mixed up. But if you go to R theta coordinates, then in terms of theta, both of them go the full range. But in terms of R, one of them will have a peak here and the other one will have a peak further off. And uh, then any program will tell you what it is. Right. So. I think I'll kind of stop here, uh, I'll pause here. Any questions at this point? So I'm um, continuing to the second problem, which is model selection. So how do you select? Um, so there's a general problem about how do you choose how many parameters to have in your model, uh, as well as, of course, you might have multiple models with the same number of parameters, and how do you choose between them? But let's just talk about the number of parameters right now. In this case, it's the number of clusters. That's really the main parameter we have. So if you have too many parameters in supervised ML, you have overfitting, as I said, um, and that will hurt your performance on test data. So you solve that in supervised learning with this cycle. But in unsupervised learning, what do you do? You don't have a test data set. Um, but if you're overfitting, in, uh, then somebody gives you a new point you might classify it completely wrongly. So um, it's widely suggested that the best answer is something called uh, the Bayesian Occam razor. Uh, so you might have heard of Occam's razor as a sort of principle by a philosopher called Henry of Occam, William of Occam. He, but basically it was uh, given two uh, explanations for something, choose the simpler one. So given two models that explain your data, choose the simpler one, but uh, what does that mean? Uh, how do you choose, how will they explain? And what uh, my case says is that you calculate something called the mar marginal likelihood. So sort of mentioned the likelihood, you can given a model, you can calculate the probability of the data given the model, and that's called the likelihood. Um, so just take an example of coin tosses again. Um, because that's always useful to do. Supposing you have a data is equal to uh, 10 tosses, seven heads and three tails. That's your data. Then the probability of the data given any, let's say fair coin model, in this case is just 10 choose seven X. Okay, let's say it's not even fair coin. Let's say it's E, Let's say theta's uh, probability of heads. So it's theta to the power seven, one minus theta to the power um, three. So if you know what theta is, then this is what it is. This is the likelihood. Now, if you don't know what theta is, you need to integrate over theta. That's called marginalizing. So you're trying theta as any number between zero and one. So that integral is called the marginal likelihood, and uh, it can be done exactly in this case. Um, but going back to the cluster situation, you actually should marginalize not only over such hyperparameters as theta, but also over the cluster assignment itself. So the model with k clusters, um, you have a large space of uh, ways to put 
n objects into k clusters and you actually need to marginalize over the entire space. So, um, but the idea is that if you do that, you will end up penalizing um, the overcomplicated models because they will fit very well in a very small region of your parameter space. But in the other regions of your parameter space, they will do very badly. So you will end up uh, choosing that set of parameters that um, doesn't hurt you too much while still doing reasonably well in the um, overall space. So this is the problem. How do you calculate the marginal likelihood? As I said, in very trivial cases, you can do it exactly, but in most cases, you need to resort to sampling. For example, in the clustering case, you need to explore every possible cluster assignment and you need to do that via sampling because otherwise there's an exponential number, you can't do it. So um, uh, the simplest thing you might do, and there are ways to sample, uh, so something called Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. It's basically given a probability distribution. You can draw, uh, you have some number for every point in your sample space, but you can't explore it. Um, exhaustively. Instead, you can explore the probability the, the sample space in proportion to the probability of the samples. And if you do that, you have a set of, let's say, M samples where M might be a thousand or a million, but it is not exponentially large. The arithmetic mean is just take all the samples, take the likelihood of all of these and just average all of them. Um, and uh, it doesn't work very well because most of your samples in your space are actually at low likelihood. Um, usually only a small part of your space is high likelihood and if you just sample you won't get it um another way to do it is called the harmonic mean method uh sort of introduce the Bayes theorem which uh, um in this context you can just write like this the posterior for the parameters given your data and given the number of k that you want is uh the likelihood of the data given the parameters on k times the prior for the parameters divided by the sum over all possible choices of parameters. But this is exactly the marginalization that we want. So this is a, actually the, um, it's the, so the numerator is actually the likelihood times the prior. So that's actually what we want to marginalize and that's the denominator. So if by just rearranging it, you get this expression that if you sample from uh, this distribution and you, Basically, um, so basically you end up uh, taking M samples and then calculating their harmonic mean. Like, okay, I think something got cropped here, but you can write this as one over the likelihood of each sample. So the harmonic mean of the likelihoods. This is widely used, but it turns out it's also not, it can go very badly wrong, um, what they call uncontrolled. The most uh, accurate method perhaps by sampling is something called thermodynamic integration where so I won't go into this at this point, um, but it's a sort of borrowed from a physics technique. So those with physics backgrounds can take a look. Um, but this is slow because essentially you are calculating an integral over a bunch of temperatures and you can show that that integral ends up being equal to your marginal likelihood. But to calculate that integral, you need like five or 10 points and at least, so it's slow. Um, there are other um, ways you can, um, Simplify this problem maybe. So um, there's something called the Bayesian information criterion. And this was described by Schwartz in 1978. It is basically an approximation to the same marginal likelihood. He um, approximates that complicated multi-parameter integral making some assumptions and ends up with uh, this formula where K is the number of parameters in your model. It's not just the number of clusters because to take the, uh, um, Gaussian mixture model case, for example, you have, uh, supposing you have um, K clusters. So K is one parameter, of course, uh, but within that, every cluster has its own uh, vector of uh, means and its own covariance matrix, which you're also trying to find. So uh, that entire set of the number of parameters is all the means and all the covariance matrix elements that you. Um, need to consider. And N is the total number of data points and L hat is the maximum of the likelihoods over all parameters, which you can estimate by sampling that, that you can do. Um, there is a previous and also still widely used criterion called the Akai K information criterion. I think the BIC is a little bit stricter and this is not motivated by Bayesian or uh, ML methods, but more from some information theory argument. 
so I don't really fully understand it myself. So, but the idea basically is that if you want, if you don't know the number of clusters, you start with two, then you go to three, you go to four, and see when your marginal likelihood, however you um, calculate it, or your um, BIC um, increases, and when it starts decreasing, that's when you stop. That means the previous number of K is the best. And that works well in uh, practice. And so for example, the uh, scikit-learn implementation of the Gaussian mixture model thing reports the BIC. And if you use the BIC as the cutoff in some benchmarks we've been doing in some projects, it actually does quite well. Um, there are some other ways to uh, do this approximately, and I'll just cover this and stop with that since, uh, so um, this is called silhouette analysis. So let me just describe what that is. Uh, it's basically, uh, you have a point in a, let's do it again. Let's say you have two clusters or you have three clusters in your particular clustering scheme. Let me do it a bit different. These are your two clusters and this is your third cluster. And uh, you have points in all of these. So um, for any point, let's take this point. A sub i is the average distance of this point to let's say the clusters are C1. The average distance of X in C1 of um, whatever distance metric you're using divided by the size of the cluster minus one because you're excluding that point itself. And let's say BI, sorry, this is C2, that point was from C2. BI or cluster one is the sum over all X in C1 of something of the same thing. Sorry, not minus one because this point is not there. Yeah, so um, these are the two numbers that you have. A is the average distance of this point to everything else in the same cluster. B for each other cluster is the average distance of this point to all the other clusters. And in fact, you pick the smallest value of B as your value of B. So B is the uh, that cluster for which the average distance of this point to all the other clusters is smallest. So in this case, it will be to C1. And now um, if you, um, take each cluster and plot this number, so yeah, and then you calculate a number called the silhouette, which is B i minus A s y divided by the maximum of those two numbers, which basically works out, uh, unless the cluster has only one element, then you choose it, you make it zero. Um, because then if you remove the cluster, you really can't calculate it in any case. Um, so you, this can be rewritten as if A is greater than B, then, um, this is B by A minus one. And uh, if uh, B is greater than A, then you can write this as uh, one minus A by B. So either way, you so you get a number between minus one and one. And uh, that's what you see in this. Uh, so, so you then, for each cluster, you plot this silhouette value for each point in the cluster in uh, sorted order from highest to lowest. And then you get a, thing like this, like these points really fit very solidly in this cluster. So if uh, the silhouette will be large, if uh, it is currently in the correct cluster and uh, it will be larger negative if it is currently definitely in the wrong cluster, it will be close to zero if it could be in either of the two clusters. So if you look down here, these are the two outliers. Um, I don't think you can read it on the screen, but um, these are basically clustering of, uh, um, again, phylogenetic data. The top cluster ends up being fish. The middle cluster is uh, insects. And the third cluster is mostly mammals. Except the last two are dolphin and porpoise. So it seems like uh, for whatever 
um, problem they were doing, those two are slightly outside. So how you use this is there is no automated way to do it. There's no number that it spits out uh, as far as I know, like uh, Bayesian information criterion. Instead, you visually look at this cluster. And if you think four would do better, you do it with four and you look at that cluster and you know you go with whatever looks better, whatever silhouette looks better. So um, this is basically how uh, this kind of analysis is done. Um, yeah, I think that is actually the end of what I have for now, the material. I um, was planning to give some such talk on Thursday and I moved it up. So uh, yeah, so I'll stop here. Any questions from any of you? So uh, I had a doubt about silhouette analysis. So you were mentioning that in, in the case of three clusters, we were seeing some points that were coming in the negative part, right? So increasing the number of clusters would help us to uh, aggregate the clusters that properly define the data set. Is that how we can interpret a silhouette analysis? So maybe this is not a very good example. Uh because here you could increase it to four clusters, but then what might end up happening is that um, these last couple of points, so uh, may end up, so if you look at them, you know, it's platypus and uh, a couple of other things that I can't read, but uh, you might get a very tiny cluster of those. So it's really a sort of judgment call, do you want that or should you go with this? Um, so, uh, but there are cases where you could imagine that Supposing you have, let me just uh, switch out a possibility. Supposing your silhouette looks like this. This is zero. And then you have another one that looks like this. Supposing you did this with k is equal to two and you're finding that there are uh, things that are uh, not fitting. So you could try, okay, let's just do one more uh, cluster. Let's say there was actually a very good cluster up there. That is the first silhouette. And then uh, second silhouette is iffy and the third silhouette is even more iffy. Now there are two possibilities that you could try and you should try both k is equal to two and k is equal to four. It could be that uh, um, reducing the number of clusters improves because these are bad because they are really close to each other. And, uh, or it could be that if you make it four clusters, then some of these points will actually go away into a separate cluster and that will improve it. So this is purely visual tool as far as I, uh, it's not here. Yeah, so you've tried both ways and you see, uh, and there are other such things people have done with. Right, I think uh, time is uh, up for Love's talk, so I'll stop now.